Thank you so much, and my uh, thanks to Professor Vargas Ramos and the other organizers uh, for being willing to include a Smith in this conference on the Jones Act. Um, I should note that this uh, uh, work draws in part on work I've done with uh, uh, Professor Jaime Luch of the University of Puerto Rico's uh, political science uh, department, so I'm glad we're uh, connecting uh, with them. I also very much regret that my responsibilities as an academic petty bureaucrat required me to be across town this morning and I couldn't join you uh, yesterday or uh, uh, this morning. Uh, uh, it is my loss. I am much less a scholar of Puerto Rico uh, than many here and I know I have much to learn from participating in this conference. I am a scholar of the empirical and normative issues, especially of achieving equal citizenship. And that may sound like an anachronistic endeavor. What normative issues can there be? Surely we are all for equal citizenship. But if equal citizenship means all persons in a political community have absolutely uniform, identical rights and duties, the truth is no one is for this kind of equal citizenship across the board. Almost no one thinks, for example, that very small children should have the right to vote or serve on juries or be drafted to do military service, although we do require them to pay taxes. Today, America's conservatives favor special accommodations, exemptions from common laws for some religious believers. Most Americans favor special accommodations for disabled persons. Liberals favor some special accommodations for long discriminated against racial and ethnic minorities and in some arenas for women. And most Americans favor at least one important difference between naturalized and birthright citizens. If naturalized citizens are shown to have lied in their naturalization processes, especially concerning their criminal records, they can lose their citizenship and be deported. Uh, birthright citizens simply cannot. And there are many more such examples of differentiation. So the reality is we do want equal citizenship. But we do not think that equal citizenship means citizenship with uniform, identical rights and duties in all cases. We differ on what the exceptions should be. The great normative issue of equal citizenship, therefore, is whether differentiations in civic rights and duties represent forms of subordination, exploitation, oppression, marginalization, second-class citizenship, or whether they are appropriate forms of differentiation that serve and don't violate the ideal of equal citizenship. So this afternoon, I will argue that the Jones Act created a novel form of legally differentiated citizenship. U.S. citizenship in an unincorporated territory, a territory that Congress has not put on the path to statehood. This category of unincorporated territory emerged only in litigation following uh, the Spanish-American War acquisitions. The Jones Act extended citizenship uh, uh, to Puerto Ricans, uh, despite the will of their uh, elected officials, and it therefore created U.S. citizenship in an unincorporated territory as a novel form of differentiated uh, citizenship. And that Jones Act citizenship, despite important legislative changes from 1940 through 1952, and despite later court decisions reducing the differences uh, between citizenship in unincorporated territories and other forms of US citizenship in the last 40 years, nonetheless today, this citizenship remains distinctive and distinctive along all the basic dimensions of legal citizenship in the ways that citizenship is acquired, in the ways that citizenship can be given up, 
and in the civil rights, political rights, and social rights that accompany citizenship, to use T.H. Marshall's classic trilogy of the basic rights of citizenship. Uh, Puerto Rican citizenship is distinct along all three dimensions. And I will also suggest that while this may seem um, an uh, residual, an anachronism in many respects, if we look at American domestic politics and if we look at international trends concerning the rights of territorial citizens, we have no reason to expect that this distinctive form of citizenship will end anytime soon. And I think that's deeply concerning because the ways in which Puerto Rican citizenship is distinctive mostly do make it a form of second-class citizenship, one that should be, and I think will eventually be altered, I hope through the choices of Puerto Ricans themselves. So, others here have and will review the history of the Jones Act far better than I can do, nor will I try to trace in detail the legislative and judicial developments affecting Puerto Rican citizenship from 1917 up to the present. Instead, I just want to summarize where we are on the basic dimensions of citizenship that I have listed. Begin with how citizenship is acquired. As Charles Venator Santiago has argued, the Jones Act collectively naturalized Puerto Ricans through congressional statute and then the Nationality Act of 1940 established that all born in Puerto Rico after January 12, 1941 were not naturalized, but birthright citizens. That's significant, but even so, their citizenship, naturalized or birthright, remains statutory citizenship. It is statutory birthright citizenship. It is not 14th Amendment constitutional birthright citizenship based on the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment. Despite the valiant and continuing efforts of Neil Ware and others, the courts have not recognized the inhabitants of any of the unincorporated territories, including Puerto Rico, as having constitutional birthright citizenship. And that matters, of course, because it means that, in principle, unlike constitutional birthright citizens, Puerto Ricans could lose their citizenship through an act of Congress. And though that may seem politically unlikely, when we think of the anxieties over Latinos in America today uh, expressed in the current presidential elections, when we look at Puerto Rico's severe economic woes, I don't think we can say it's inconceivable that politics might move to deprive Puerto Ricans of their civic status. So that's on how citizenship is acquired, this merely statutory form of birthright citizenship. Let's turn next to how citizenship can be given up. In 1868, Congress declared by statute that, quote, the right of expatriation, the right to give up your citizenship, is a natural and inherent right of all people, and that official acts which restrict or impair this right are, quote, inconsistent with the fundamental principles of this government. This expatriation right is, I believe, the only right to be declared a natural right in official U.S. statutes. And, in some ways, that's not surprising for a nation that began in a massive act of expatriation that was completely illegal under British positive law. So, claiming a natural right to expatriation makes sense. Even so, the U.S. government has long held that U.S. citizens can expatriate themselves only outside the United States. And, the same is true for Puerto Ricans, but this similarity creates a distinctive dilemma for Puerto Ricans who do wish to be Puerto Rican citizens, but who do not wish to have the form of U.S. citizenship derived uh, ultimately from the uh, Jones Act, as well as the 1940 Nationality Act. 
And this issue, uh, as noted in the introduction, has been litigated repeatedly in the last two decades, chiefly in litigation brought by the Puerto Rican independence activist Juan Marie Bras. He announced his U.S. citizenship in Venezuela in 1994 and did initially receive a State Department certificate of loss of nationality, uh, but uh, he returned to live in uh, Puerto Rico and uh, sought uh, to act, including acting politically, as a Puerto Rican citizen, but not a citizen of the United States. Um, and in 1997, the Supreme Court of uh, Puerto Rico uh, held that Marie Bras was, in fact, still a citizen of Puerto Rico, entitled to uh, full political rights. The opinion said that the change in Puerto Rico's status um, uh, from 1950 through 1952, acquiring a constitution and commonwealth status, uh, meant uh, that the powers of the people of Puerto Rico were not, as before, merely delegated by Congress, but rather stemmed from itself and were free uh, from higher authority. Puerto Rican officials have continued to hold to this uh, uh, position in, in a 2006 memorandum. Puerto Rico's Secretary of Justice affirmed uh, the ruling um, and uh, Marie Bras received a state certificate of uh, Puerto Rico. But around the same time, uh, Alberto Lozada Colon uh, similarly renounced his citizenship in the Dominican Republic, uh, similarly uh, reclaimed residence in Puerto Rico and sought to assert Puerto Rican citizenship and uh, uh, as this uh, appeared to be uh, a mounting movement, uh, the U.S. courts um, uh, insisted that it was not uh, legal to renounce your citizenship uh, unless you were willing to renounce, quote, all the rights and privileges of United States citizenship. And by living in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Cologne, uh, according to the U.S. District Court, continued to exercise one of the fundamental rights of citizenship, namely the right to travel freely throughout the world and when he wants to, ret and when he wants to return and reside in the United States, since the court said it is unmistakably clear that Puerto Rico is part of the United States. Uh, so the uh, U.S. government indicated that you could not uh, renounce U.S. citizenship and continue to resign in Puerto Rico. Uh, the State Department uh, withdrew Marie Bras' uh, certificate of loss of nationality. And so in regard to choosing to give up your citizenship, um, this expatriation right uh, declared to be a natural right in U.S. statutes is limited. Now, it is limited for all U.S. Uh, uh, citizens, uh, but um, uh, it works a special hardship on citizens of Puerto Rico uh, who object uh, to the uh, forms of U.S. citizenship uh, that have been uh, thrust upon them. So, in regard to how citizenship is acquired, in regard to how citizenship should give up, there are distinctive features now I want to turn to the substantive rights that citizenship includes. And again, T.H. Marshall famously argued at the end of World War II that there are three basic kinds of citizenship rights. There are civil rights, by which he meant procedural rights in legal cases, and also basic economic rights that would be enforced in legal cases. In addition to the civil rights, uh, he designated political rights, which include rights to vote and to hold office. And finally, he included social rights of citizenship, rights to things like health care, education, housing, employment, and more. And again, along all these dimensions, Puerto Rican citizenship is distinctive. Uh, in the case of civil rights, the situation is parallel to the situation in regard to birthright citizenship, that is, uh, Puerto Ricans uh, do have uh, a wide range of civil rights, but uh, as a result of statute, not constitutional guarantees. In the case of Balzac versus Puerto Rico in 1922, uh, the Supreme Court uh, asserted that the, con the constitutional protections, such as Bill of Rights, criminal justice, procedural guarantees, do not automatically apply to 
the U.S. citizens in, living in Puerto Rico or other unincorporated territories, the Supreme Court held that it is a matter of congressional choice whether to extend uh, many of these rights to uh, unincorporated, unincorporated territory citizens. That fundamental legal reality persists. That difference is still there. Though its significance is admittedly diminished in part by Puerto Rico's establishment of a Bill of Rights in uh, its own constitution, uh, which Congress uh, endorsed, and it's been diminished by uh, a number of court rulings that have, over time, extended the list of rights, uh, civil rights deemed fundamental enough to apply automatically to Puerto Rican uh, citizens. And some, in fact, thought that when the uh, Supreme Court uh, in the uh, Boumediene versus Bush decision um, uh, addressed habeas corpus rights, it, uh, it indicated that those uh, uh, rights or remedies, if you will, uh, were constitutionally guaranteed to all in unincorporated territories as well as uh, others. But, at a minimum, there remains a lot of constitutional, legal, and political dispute over these, uh, the degree to which a variety of basic legal civil rights are, in fact, constitutionally guaranteed to the citizens of unincorporated territories, including uh, Puerto Rico. There remains many assertions of congressional powers if Congress chooses uh, to limit a number of civil rights protections for such citizens. And the very fact that there are such disputes means that Puerto Rican citizenship is distinctive from the uh, many forms of U.S. citizenship where such rights are clearly, unequivocally, constitutionally guaranteed. The fact that there is continued contestation on these kinds of civil rights makes Puerto Rican citizenship not only distinctive, but distinctively vulnerable in important ways. Now let me turn to economic rights, the other category under civil rights uh, in Marshall's uh, framework. Uh, in regard to some economic rights and duties, uh, Puerto Rico is actually less distinctive than uh, the other unincorporated territories because Congress has treated it um, and the courts have uh, agreed that it can be treated as within the United States for purposes of customs uh, duties and tariffs, unlike uh, other incorporated territories. Uh, and quite famously, even though Puerto Ricans pay most federal taxes, uh, they do not pay federal income taxes which may well be a form of differentiated citizenship that many other American citizens envy deeply. But it has become clear in the current economic crisis that the uh, distinctive uh, features of Puerto Rican economic rights have severe limitations, uh, particularly the, distinct the distinctive limits on Puerto Rico's self-governing economic powers uh, because federal bankruptcy laws um, specifically uh, exempt uh, from Puerto Rico uh, the opportunity to take various kinds of municipal bankruptcy actions that are available uh, within the states. It means that they have uh, fewer alternatives uh, to cope with financial crises for public corporations. They can't declare uh, bankruptcy in the way uh, that the states uh, can do. And uh, this has, in the eyes of most observers, uh, severely exacerbated uh, the economic crisis. So in regard to economic rights, powers, and duties, uh, the distinctive uh, status of Puerto Rico um, has costs, um, as we'll see uh, further uh, as I go along. Now, turning from civil rights to uh, political rights, here the story is uh, very familiar. Uh, Puerto Ricans have no right to vote in federal elections for the Congress uh, or the presidency. This is also a feature of Puerto Rican citizenship that has been 
uh, intensely contested in the last two decades. In 1994, uh, Gregorio Igartua de la Rosa began a series of cases in which he and other U.S. citizens residing in Puerto Rico claim to have constitutional rights to vote for president and for members of the House of Representatives. A variety uh, have argu of arguments have been used in court over time. Uh, they have all been rejected by the lower federal courts up to this time. The courts have regularly insisted uh, that the Constitution provides for the president to be uh, elected by electors chosen by the states and Puerto Rico uh, is not a state, even though its commonwealth status is supposed to be state-like in many other regards, state-lite as well as state-like when it comes to uh, uh, political uh, powers. In 2000, the U.S. District Court for the District of Puerto Rico ruled that the right to vote uh, in national elections was a right guaranteed by the First Amendment principle of freedom of association, the Due Process and Equal Protection Clause, um, and it also interpreted the Congressional Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act as indicating uh, that you didn't have to reside in a state in order to vote. Uh, but that ruling was quickly uh, overturned. I imagine that Judge Torriello discussed these cases last time because he was, uh, or last night, because he uh, uh, wrote in uh, a number of them, initially uh, saying that uh, it was right to say that there was no vote in national elections because, the, uh, as he put it, unfortunately, the practicality of the matter is that Puerto Rico uh, remains a colony. Uh, over time, as the litigation uh, continues, he continued, he came to attack the unincorporated, incorporated territory distinction as a judicial invention rooted in uh, racism. Uh, and uh, he argued that according to uh, international law, uh, it should be recognized that uh, the inhabitants of Puerto Rico had a right to vote uh, in national elections. But although um, new arguments have continued to be made, um, uh, including appeal to other language in the Constitution, uh, the notion that the House of Representatives uh, shall be uh, chosen by we the people of the United States, although the Constitution says the people of the several states, uh, all these kinds of arguments uh, have been unsuccessful. And so it remains a clear and sharp differentiation in terms of political rights uh, that Puerto Ricans cannot vote in national elections. And also, although the issue has been less uh, litigated, it's also true uh, that Puerto Rican citizens are not eligible to run for president of the United States if they have lived their whole lives in Puerto Rico because the Constitution requires you to have resided in the United States for 14 years. That was in the original Constitution to keep new immigrants from running for office. Um, and the lower courts have indicated that residents in Puerto Rico even though for purposes of expatriation, Puerto Rico is clearly part of the United States, in terms of eligibility to run for president, residence in Puerto Rico does not count. And so um, uh, residence in Puerto Rico means uh, that there are not the same office uh, holding rights uh, as well as limitations in uh, voting rights. So that's civil rights, political rights. Let me now turn briefly to social rights, which is an area I'm still uh, studying and uh, don't feel uh, fully authoritative on, uh, but some things are clear. Uh, first, as Bernie Sanders and Hillary, Hillary Clinton reminded us Tuesday, the U.S. does not have a very robust self social welfare state at all compared to, say, Denmark. <laughs> But the United States does have a social security system. Uh, it does have federal health care programs, Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act. It has some federal education and some housing programs um, and more. Now, Puerto Ricans do pay social security taxes, so they are eligible for social security uh, benefits. But they have been excluded from supplemental security income, which is supported by uh, general revenues. And there are a range of studies on how federally assisted programs are uh, providing uh, the services that fall under the heading of social rights in Puerto Rico, particularly uh, studies of the medical care provided 
to Medicaid recipients in Puerto Rico uh, that suggests that these social rights are being provided in a systematically less adequate and sufficient way for uh, citizens of uh, Puerto Rico. And so, um, uh, along every dimension, how citizenship is acquired, how it's given up, the civil, political, and social rights of citizenship, Puerto Rican citizenship is today, 100 years after the Jones Act, still distinctive, and I think in most regards, uh, the distinctions are uh, differentiations that make Puerto Rican citizenship certainly not worthless, but second class compared to that enjoyed by other uh, American citizens. Well, if we take that view, we have to ask, what are the prospects for change? And I'm a political scientist, so I uh, look at the political trends uh, for change. It was mentioned earlier today, in 2012, Puerto Ricans indicated emphatically in referendum that they wanted to uh, change the status quo. Uh, but I don't think any analyst of American domestic politics expects any action on this topic any time soon. Not only uh, are both parties preoccupied with different agendas, the fundamental fact is that the Republicans are in control of Congress, and uh, Puerto Ricans vote overwhelmingly Democratic. And if Puerto Rico uh, became a state, uh, it not only would have the same number of senators as every other state, it is also, uh, despite the loss of population in recent years, it still has more population than about 20 states. And so it would have non-trivial representation in the Congress of the United States that would predictably vote Democratic, and uh, the uh, uh, Republicans can't agree on a Speaker of the House. Uh, <laughs> if you think that they will agree anytime soon somehow to give Puerto Rico the opportunities uh, for uh, statehood, um, it's just not, or independence for that matter, um, uh, it's not just going, uh, it's not going to happen. And indeed, um, uh, unfortunately, I think the still unlikely, but if anything, slightly more likely scenario is that um, if uh, uh, really conservative Republicans ma managed to take over uh, the White House as well as the presidency, uh, the more likely scenario would be that um, Puerto Rico uh, would be expelled rather than given a choice of its own uh, status. Well, now that expulsion doesn't seem um, likely, though, as I indicated, and one reason is uh, that it would be shocking to the international community. and. Uh, you might say that if you look at uh, the UN documents and international treaties uh, that uh, affecting territorial statuses uh, that have been ratified, um, including often by the United States uh, over the last uh, 70 years, really, uh, that there is plenty of evidence of an international law consensus uh, in favor of uh, providing territories um, either with independence or very robust uh, self-governing powers that would probably include powers to vote in uh, national elections and uh, more. Uh, but I want to submit, if you look at the way that the major former European powers, imperial powers, are treating their overseas territories and the citizens over those overseas territories in the last 15 years, you will not see a trend toward greater equality of political status and membership, at least not in all regards. In the early 2000s, uh, Britain reformulated its law to make a variety of entities, 14 in all, uh, some of which had been labeled dependent territories. Now they are all overseas British territories, and under a 1981 Act, they have overseas British citizenship. Overseas British citizenship, in a nutshell, guarantees you all the rights of British citizens except the opportunity to enter the United Kingdom. So <laughs> it is more limited in a fundamental way than um, uh, Puerto Rican citizenship. 
and it was enacted precisely out of a concern that these territorial inhabitants might uh, come to uh, Britain. Um, and what about France? The republic in all the world that emphasizes its commitment to equal, undifferentiated citizenship. All French citizens are supposed to be equal, so much so that it does not collect officially collect government statistics on race, ethnicity, religion, all not relevant to citizenship in uh, French eyes. But France has uh, an incredibly complex pattern of uh, different types of overseas territories uh, that I, uh, I won't review uh, the different statuses, but uh, they go by these acronyms that include TOMS, DOMS, CTOMS, and ZROMS. Uh, they're also TOMS. These are all different kinds of uh, overseas territories of France. And since 2000, largely in an effort to prevent overseas territories from uh, demanding economic assistance of France, uh, France, in the words of President Chirac, um, has said, said at, at that time that the day of uniform statuses are over and each overseas collectivity should evolve if it so wishes toward a somehow tailored status. Chirac's su successor Sarkozy argued that the unity of the Republic does not imply a uniformity of its institutions. And he endorsed for each overseas territory an organization adapted to its own characteristics, as long as this doesn't affect the principle of the unity of the uh, Republic. Uh, well, this sounds attractive, giving um, each territory uh, an uh, greater distinctive autonomous uh, existence and modes of political self-organization, but many of the territories have rejected the status as being thrust upon them, somewhat as the Jones Act for us citizenship um, on Puerto Ricans, uh, because it's clear uh, that the primary uh, uh, French motive is to lessen the national state's financial obligations. And again, I think that might stand as a warning about uh, the potential future of uh, Puerto Rico if its economic woes continue. Now, having painted this whole picture of enduring civic differentiation a um, hundred years after the Jones Act, um, let me say that ultimately, uh, I don't think the United States uh, will um, uh, expel Puerto Rico if Puerto Rico doesn't, Puerto Ricans don't choose independence. Uh, it concerns over uh, the Puerto Rican economy um, and Latino identity, I don't think will uh, ultimately lead to expulsion. I do, in the longer run, see a new coalition gradually emerging in American politics that I believe will reach majority status. It will be more multicultural than ever before. It will have a stronger Latino voice than ever before, and uh, it will not support these kinds of policies. It is possible that this coalition may, over time, repopulate the Supreme Court, and that matters because the reason I call these unresolved constitutional issues of Puerto Rican citizenship is that on most of them, the Supreme Court has never ruled. Only the lower courts have ruled, and there is still possibility for these constitutional controversies to be resolved um, in a uh, different direction. Um, I think it may be even more likely that a future Congress may uh, decide that it is time to give Puerto Ricans uh, real and unfettered choices about their status regarding uh, statehood or uh, independence. Um, and uh, my personal hope is that Puerto Ricans will choose statehood uh, while uh, preserving a distinctive uh, cultural identity in ways that I believe uh, would enrich. The United States of America. But if these changes seem possible, maybe even likely in the long run, they're not at all likely in the years immediately ahead. And they will occur only if Americans, including Puerto Ricans, decide that Jones Act derived citizenship is a form of citizenship that is different and not sufficiently equal to be acceptable in the United States of the 21st century. Thank you.